And we are recording. We are live. Good morning. Welcome. Happy Friday. Flex those muscles. Let's stretch out. Let's get ready for our workout. <laughs> All right. We're going we're gonna to be working out this morning, at least on our brains a little bit. Mm -hmm. We might not do jack. <laughs> uh, so um, this is Ask Me Anything. So you guys, we can start off with you asking me anything, or I can just start talking about what I was kind of working on this morning. I have a question. Go for it. Okay, I watched you on the webinar yesterday on the real estate. Okay. And my question was, have you ever written your book on property management you were talking about? Never got was? published, never will get published. It oh. was, um, <laughs> um, well, first of all, it got to the point where by the time it could have gotten published, I said it was all about desktop. And I said, yeah. space. it really, if anything, should have been about QuickBooks uh, online. That's what I was wondering. So uh, I decided to scrap it. And uh, I was also, um, I was working with somebody at the Sleater Group on it, uh, and we just weren't really connecting well. Um, her name's Deborah, and she's worked with Doug for years, and uh, right. she's the one who, I guess, historically had always handled all the educational stuff for him. And uh, there was just a lot of back and forth and miscommunication, and that's what caused a lot of delays, and then in the end, it was like, Basically, she and I were pointing fingers at one another, to be honest. And uh, I've been thinking about dropping my Sleater Group membership. It doesn't seem quite the same with Doug Sleater, you know. Yeah, I don't know. I, um, I've been, you know, people have been asking me, like, about the conferences. I'm not going to Account Techs. I'm going to QuickBooks Connect. Um, you know, I just, uh, there are things that they're doing that I don't like. Plus, they never bothered to reach out to me. I mean, I don't presume to know how to um, run a conference, but from a strictly logical standpoint, it seems to me that if I were to, let's say, buy a company that ran a conference, I would probably, the first thing I'd want to do as far as lining up speakers would be to look at who has spoken there in prior, in recent prior years, especially I'd say, <laughs> who were the top rated speakers? And I would certainly want to call the top 10 first and say, hey, we'd love to have you back. Now, to it, because I spoke at QuickBooks Connect last year, did that. They called me. They said, hey, Seth, you got great feedback from our audience last year, and we definitely want you back this year. Countex did not bother to do that. Um, and in prior years, I felt like I had to chase them a little bit to get me to speak there. And this year, I've just been too busy. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to chase them. I'm gonna, you know, if they want me, they can invite me. They know how to find me. If not, I'm just going to, you know, sort of, I, I had a conversation about it with Doug recently where I said, you know, I'm going to go where I'm supported, <laughs> you know, and I don't get the feeling that I'm sort of supported over there at AccountTex anymore. I was taking a uh, for CPE their luncheon, and the speaker was on selling a business, but looking at it from the purchaser standpoint, mm. and he was using his father as an example. He had this big trucking, uh, fruit produce business, but the problem was he didn't really have a business. He had a, basically a job, and I think it kind of illustrates the difficulty in selling a business when the principal is so intimately identified with the business and branded as the business and then trying to sell it to, I mean, look at the Sweden group. I mean, they don't have the monthly conferences anymore. Right. And, and, and they're kind of focused on QB desktop. I'm kind of wondering, you know. Yeah, well, a lot of their membership, I think, are frankly – uh, people who've been around for a while and that's what they're used to is desktop and yeah. I you know it's it's funny the the dichotomy in terms of you know people who are like like yesterday when I did that webinar at CPA Academy um, there was somebody there who in the comments pointed you know said something to the effect that she's converted like 20 companies over from desktop to QuickBooks online she's clearly like diehard QuickBooks online I I guess you could say somewhere in the middle, but I'm definitely slanted toward QuickBooks Online because I, you know, I put my own company on QuickBooks Online. <laughs> I will, uh, any, any clients that come in where I'm doing the consulting work, training is another story. Training, I'll let them be in whatever they want to be in and I'll train them on it, you know, because as long as I have the experience and the knowledge, of course. Um, so QuickBooks Desktop, Zero, you know, any of the Sage products that I work on, you know, I can train people in them. But as soon as somebody comes in the door and, and let's say wants to sign up for my business management service where I'm going to have them completely outsource their accounting to me, they're going in QuickBooks Online. Period, dot, the end. That's, that's what I'm using. And part of that is for my own sake, I need to have a good streamlined process internally 
and I've been writing a lot about this, is where I want to stay focused. And one of my ways of staying laser focused is by being sort of singular in purpose in terms of the product that I'm using to serve my clients. Right. So that's why I've decided on the consulting side, I had to pick one. And as far as the cloud-based accounting apps go, this is my opinion, QuickBooks Online is the superior product, especially when you get into the reporting side, which is where I think a lot of us miss is the ultimate output of the bookkeeping or accounting service, right? Yeah, I, agree with, I agree with that. I think Zero's reports are, you know, kind of amazing with Zero. This. They've been saying all along for a year now they're going to have these great reports and nothing's really happening. I'm just kind of wondering what's going on. I really get the impression that Zero is built for companies whose primary purpose in having accounting data is just to get a tax return filed. Mm -hmm. So they do a good job of giving you the basic reports. You go into Zero, you can run all your standard reports. You can, you know, your balance sheet, your profit and loss. I don't like their statement of cash flows at all, but I don't need that to do a tax return, right? They use, there's two methods for statement of cash flows. There's the direct method and the indirect method. Right. They use the direct method. First of all, they didn't have a statement of cash flows until like within the last year they released it. And I wrote an article about it. You can see it. It's on SethDavid.com uh, where I actually bash them a little bit about it because they use the direct method, which doesn't really help in terms of analyzing the difference between net income accrual basis and cash. The direct method only looks at cash flows. It doesn't look at the accrual basis net income, doesn't look at the changes to the balance sheet accounts across the board. So I can understand really where the cash flow is coming from. Right. So if you're going to have a statement of cash flows, in my opinion, it really needs to be the indirect method. Now, the other thing is zero being based in Europe outside of the United States, you know, they still build it very much, I think, based on the way that people use this stuff in Europe. So, um, and Adam says in the chat, indirect method is accounting 101, right? right. So you, you statement, to me, the direct method for the statement of cash flows is, is, is useless. I can't do anything with it. It doesn't really give me anything that I need. To me, it's more complicated too. I mean, in terms of my understanding, I like the indirect method. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, it's gotta be. And it's funny because at first I was like, what is this? I didn't even recognize it. I forgot that there was a direct method. You know, yeah. I, I had just gotten so accustomed to, and I actually had to Google it, you know, um, like a statement of cash flows. I forgot what I searched for exactly, but then I started coming up with, you know, articles on the difference that explained. Um, let me just read uh, the chat here. Uh, so it's, these days I'm feeling quite a realm being a one person shop. The need to know so much with the app <laughs> taking its toll on me. Do you have a fix for my situation? So I think my, my answer to you is just what I started to lay out in terms of QuickBooks and doing that everywhere else, you know, is just choosing. In fact, one of the things I was thinking about last night is I, I love, the best way to build your systems is around a live client, right? So what I've done, and that's what I've done, and I'm using 17 hats for both my lead generation and my onboarding process now, and all this content's gonna be coming out soon in terms of how I'm doing this stuff and how I'm using 17 hats specifically. That's kind of the next thing. Um, but the, you know, the, the objective here is to identify, here are the apps we're using for, the, for these purposes. So one of the things I thought of last night, based on my actual experience, now onboarding my second business management client this year, you know, these business management clients are, they're, they're very heavily front loaded in terms of onboarding, right? Because I am outsourcing the entire process. So I need to get everything in house into my system so I can manage all of it. That's what business management is. <laughs> and so, you know, I've really begun to um, detail a thorough process in 17 hats for how to get these clients onboarded. And one of the things I was thinking about last night is rather than look case by case at each client and which apps they might use, I'm going to build into the <laughs> email. I actually think this is kind of clever um, because I have affiliate links with a lot of the apps that I want to use. So what I'm going to do is build an email into the onboarding workflow that I have um, that at a certain point goes out and says, you know, here are the apps that we're going to use potentially with you. If you're interested in using these apps, you know, click these links here to sign up and it's going to be T-sheets for time tracking and it's going to be Expensify if we have expense reporting needs. And I'm going to use my affiliate links in that email so that as they're, the clients are deciding which services they want and they click to sign up, of course, I get the credit for having sent them. You know, um, and by the way, I haven't mentioned this enough, but you've got to get into Finograph now for your clients. It's free. It's a no-brainer. Right. So you have to put Finograph into the mix. It's so easy. Just link it up. And once you link it up, you know, it's done. And then use that for your reporting. Again, the ultimate output. 
um, you know, the ultimate output is the reporting. And going back to where I think zero falls short, it's in the reporting, it's in the lack of, of flexibility with respect to how I can customize reports in Zero. I have a hard time getting a transaction by customer. You, know, you can't. That was, that's exactly one of my points, and I recently bashed them on that on, in Facebook because I was so frustrated that I can't get – one of the most basic reports I want to be able to run on every client just about because just about every client I deal with at some point is going to have a deposit received from a client right. is to be able to total that liability by customer. And I was shocked because Zero has expanded on their reports and it's gotten much better. But when I go to total that liability account and I look at the options I have for what I can total by, there's a lot of things I would never care about totaling it by. And then I don't have the most important thing, which is the ability to total it by customer. I want to find out what I charged them last year for a tax return just to kind of first, you know, see if it's appropriate or, you know, maybe I should charge more. And I have to kind of basically go into an income statement by detail and kind of, you know, look for it. And it's just really amazing to me that I can't get a, you know, a transaction or a report summarized by client detail as to what the transactions were for each client in a certain time frame. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a little crazy making to me. Yeah. So uh, what's the question? Do you have clients best suited for enterprise and still move them to QBO? So best suited for enterprise, of course, is subjective. <laughs> um, but I'm finding that, yeah, there have been some businesses typically that, you know, still needed really to be in QuickBooks Enterprise. So, you know, the classic example is a company that's heavy with inventory and manufacturing concern where we have work and process inventory and assembly items. But even there... I'm becoming of the mindset that the next time I have, first of all, in my business uh, management vertical, I won't take those clients on. Too much complexity. So, you know, so I, and I, so I can't streamline it as well. So for business management purposes, you know, I'll, I'll train them. I'll get online with them remotely and show them how to do it. But I'm not going to take them on as a consulting client because it just eats up too much resources to manage their inventory. And because there's only so much I can do from here remotely, so I have to get on them to take their inventory accounts regularly so I can adjust the inventory and it's just too much work. And then I had a client like this that I took on last year at one point and it was just impossible. Um, in fact, we had a whole conversation around it because I ran the inventory reports and nothing was accurate. It was clear there were a lot of inventory items with negative quantities. And it's funny, and this is where we get into a whole different conversation about how to deal with clients. But I had a whole conversation with this woman about, you know, we looked at the inventory together and she agreed it was a mess and that it was not accurate. And she said, you know what, I have another system I'm using to track inventory. Let's not track inventory in QuickBooks. So we had this whole conversation, I said, okay, no problem. I can just write off all the inventory values, offset it to cost of goods sold, then just take account for me, and we'll convert it from a perpetual to a periodic inventory system in QuickBooks. And she agreed. And, she, and I said, so, but let's do it as of a clean date. And this was like actually about a year ago, because I remember telling her, on July 1st, I'm going to do it. Right, I'm going to log in because and this is another thing. And this is why I refuse to be consulting with clients who are still on desktop because I had to log in remotely through her go to my PC account or whatever it was. And I just hate using those services. They're just very clunky. The experience is not smooth. The screen is sort of like delayed. You have to wait. It just makes me crazy. So anyway, I go in like shortly after the first of July, do exactly what we discussed. And, um, you know, and then what I had to do is I had to duplicate all the items uh, and just set them up as non-inventory parts because she still needed to be able to use those items in her estimates. I got that. We had discussed it, and I'm clear on, you know, what needed to be done. So I did that. You know, I basically took her um, inventory parts list, exported it to Excel, then wrote down all the values, got them all to zero, average cost down to zero, then took what I had exported from the inventory parts and uploaded them into QuickBooks, you know, using the add, edit, multiple list entries. And I brought them to the same ones in as, um, as non-inventory parts. And I appended the name somehow. So this way, the salespeople who had to go in there and do estimates still had what they needed in the item list to produce the estimates. They wouldn't have known the difference. They don't know what's an inventory part and what's not. They just know they need to put this item on the estimate and send it out to the prospective client. So, <clears throat> so I did all that. Now, obviously, I thought it through, and I, I've done this for a minute. I know what I'm doing. 
So I get the scathing email from her when she realizes <laughs> what I'd done. Why did you do this without checking with me first? And blah, 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 blah. And, I, <laughs> and mind you, this was not the first time I had to deal with her on this level. I actually had to take over doing the account because she was very abusive towards the guy that I had doing the book. <laughs> Um, and I, I had given her fair warning at a certain point, like, you know, one more insulting email like this and we're done. <laughs> and, and so first she sends that emails, you know, and I responded saying, look, we discussed this, you know, I'll go in and change it back. But, you know, for the record, we discussed this and I told you I was going to do it. And you thanked me, you know, because I was going to clean this up for you. And then I get another email from her talking about how you obviously don't have experience working with companies with inventory. And blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so, you know, it was another one of those like long novel emails. And at that point, I just wrote back like two sentences, say, okay, I'm sorry, we're done. You know, consider this my termination of our services. I'm not going to put up with, you know, <laughs> client. I'm just not. So <laughs> that was the end. So let's take it back to Larry's question about so, clients so, best suited for enterprise. Okay. And so this, this makes it pretty clear that um, unless you're set up for it and they're local and you're willing to go do inventory counts or whatever, it's best to avoid that kind of thing, right? It depends on what you want to do in your firm. In my own case, I've made a decision that, you know, here's my goal and why I won't take those clients on on the business management side is because I have a very specific business plan. I've rewritten my, I'm actually still in the process of rewriting my business plan for Nerd Enterprises. And what it really surrounds is on the consulting side, the idea that I want to take on these clients and offer a very robust service where I'm managing everything, but it all gets streamlined because I'm going to use the apps to create the efficiency. These are clients, you know, when, if you've looked on my website at what I'm charging for the service, you know, it's, it's ba the basic service, the real service, the one that I want most people signing up for is $1,500 a month. So I'm not going for clients at that level that are small. These are mostly clients that are a million and up in revenue. Mm -hmm. That can that have the kind of cash flow where they can afford that level of service and afford those fees. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm looking at clients who have the cash flow that they can always pay their bills on time because then I can actually streamline the whole AP process. I can put a lot of their bills on auto pay. And, you know, originally my plan was to use bill.com and then I said, I don't even need to do that. They're going to give me their logins for every bill that they ever pay every single week. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to link up their bank account. And every one of these services just about has an option when you go in to pay them on their own websites directly to link up your bank account and choose an option that says just automatically pay the balance due every month. And so I do that because then the charge comes through, comes down in the bank feeds, gets coded, set up the rules, memorize the transaction. 95% of my accounts payable process is automated. I don't have to do it. So I, what I want is to build a vertical around these business management clients where I can really streamline things. I can't streamline an inventory business. Now, there might be somebody out there who says, no, you know what? I want the challenge. I want to take this on, which is fine. You know, you just have to decide in your firm what you want to do and what you're willing to take on and plan on building your system internally around having the resources to provide the service. Now, at the end of the day, whether you're doing inventory and manufacturing or construction companies with complex job costing, which is another one I won't touch for the same reasons. It's a lot of resources required to manage. Um, but if you want to serve those clients, then you've got to build your fees up to make sure that you can afford the resources needed to provide that service. And based on that, you have to be prepared to set up the systems. Now, could you go to QBO with those clients? Yes, absolutely. But you're going to need to tag an add-on application like an SOS inventory for inventory management, which, mind you, gives you in QBO the very same functionality that you would have if you're running QuickBooks Enterprise with advanced inventory. <laughs> SOS does all that stuff. The problem with SOS is it's not pretty. And that might sound silly, but it makes a difference. First of all, it's hard to get clients. It's, it's hard to inspire the client's confidence when they look at the application. <laughs> they would invest more into the infrastructure and make the interface a little easier to look at and, and easier to work with, frankly. Um, but they don't. So I've had people look at it and say, I don't even care if this works well. I just can't work eight hours a day in a product that looks this bad. And I'm sure you've looked at a fishbowl, right? I've looked at Fishbowl. I, it's been a long time. And I'll be honest, I love the people at Fishbowl. 
But I had two or three clients years back that I, I implemented. And it was great because I became a reseller and I made a nice commission. And all three of those clients spent almost $20,000 and never got properly implemented and onboarded into Fishbowl. Ooh. None of them were able to end up using the products. All three of them had problems. And what happened was when they signed up initially, the fees they paid included a certain amount of training. And then the trainers are these <laughs> three people that Fishbowl sort of contracts with. <laughs> and they end up using most of the training time on really just interviewing the clients to get questions answered so they know how to set things up and map them right? That's not training. That's setup. Right. The problem is there's nothing much left for training at the end of the day and the client doesn't know how to use the product. And in one case, I had the clients pay even a little bit more because they wanted the wireless Bluetooth scanners in their warehouses and they couldn't get the scanners to work. And at one point, I even went on my client's behalf back to Fishbowl and said, hey, you guys need to fix this. They paid a ton of money, you know, and it's not working. And I need to make sure that my client doesn't lose confidence in me, I recommended you, I need this to work. Somehow, get it, this is your product, these are your scanners, go in there and make it work. And they didn't. So, uh, for that reason, I stopped dealing with Fishbowl. Uh, so, and they just, they, they, the company gave my client a bunch of excuses about, oh, it's your wireless, it's your router, it's, it became one of those games of their, them throwing their, the, the, the client's infrastructure under the bus and saying it's not our fault, and it's like, I, you know, if somebody pays me for a product, I make it my fault until it gets working. I don't care. I have to do whatever it takes to get that to work. Even if I've got to send somebody on site and fix their network, I don't care. You know, yeah. to me, it's that important to deliver a remarkable service and a remarkable experience. <clears throat> I had a customer this week, you know, did some one-on-one -on -one training with me, <clears throat> had one session, we went through a bunch of stuff, and he said it was beyond expectations. This week, we did a second session, and I could tell he was a little disappointed at the end. We weren't able to get through everything because it took a while to accomplish what I, I felt we needed to accomplish, and then we ran short on time. And I wrote an email back to him after the fact, the positive, and say, hey, I'm sorry I got a little rushed at the end. And he wrote me back, honestly, and said, look, the first session was well beyond my expectations, but to be honest, the second session was below expectations. And I knew the guy wasn't BSing me. He wasn't being manipulative. And so I wrote back to him. I said, you know what? Here's a link. Sign up for another 30 minutes on the house. Let's get this done. Because I know that's about all we need is another 30 minutes to get through the rest of what we needed. Yeah, perfect. That's what you have to do. You have to sort of guarantee satisfaction. You have to guarantee. And, and he said to me, he wrote back, he says, I don't even know what to say, but thank you. And I wrote back to him and, and, and I, said, I, I said, I want you to be blown away, right? right? I don't want you walking away from this experience feeling anything short of that. And clearly he was feeling something short of that. And it wasn't that he was trying to manipulate me or get me to give him something for free. It just, you know, it wasn't what he expected. He thought we were going to get through it all within the hour. So, you know, I could have sat there and said, well, it's your fault and you didn't, you, it took you too long to learn the stuff and that's what made it take so long. And there might have even been some validity to arguments along those lines from me, but that's not, making those arguments is not going to keep the customer for life. Right? No, no, you got to own it. Right? So you got to own it. I got to take responsibility for everything that ever goes wrong in my business and it's up to me to fix it. Yeah, you know, the thing is, though, is you need to, in order to be able to deliver that and be efficient, you need to specialize and so having these one-offs like inventory it's I mean to me I'd ask myself well maybe I could be doing three clients you know and something I'm specialized in versus something that I have to you know struggle with and go back and review and all that it's just not worth it I mean it's more efficient and probably more profitable to specialize on something they can do three instead of trying to struggle through one you know Right. But, and then the answer again, going back to, so when and why should or would somebody service inventory or complex job costing client needs? And the, the answer is you can choose that. What I would say is then specialize in that. Don't do the service-based business. Be the guy or the woman that only does inventory manufacturing companies, but you got to charge a lot. You know, you, that's the whole point is if I'm going to serve those industries because they take more resources to service, I've got to charge more for that. Right. And then we get into the whole, you know, value pricing discussion, which I prefer to, uh, you know, call power pricing. It's sort of my, you know, version of it um, where I look at it as, you know, the power is in the hands of the consultant to decide what amount of money is going to get them excited to go do the work, you know. And if you read on my blog on SethDavid.com, um, you know, I have a column in there called The Hustle. And um, one of the things I wrote about in that column 
is um, wait, is it in the hustle? No, go into the marketing segment. I'll I'll share my screen and show you the link. Um, there's um, it's one of the more popular articles that I wrote this year, and it's basically the number one reason why you're getting your pricing wrong. And part of it is my uh, effort at poking a bit of a hole in the theory that sits behind what value pricing is all about. Because they're trying to tell you to, to charge based on the value of the services. And I get where you're coming from, and it makes sense. But at the same time, I'm going to go out there and excuse my language, but I'm going to say it's bullshit. Yeah. And the reason I feel that way about it is because when you break it down into the true economic principles of it, there's only one thing that drives the price of a product or service. And it's a basic law of economics, and it's called supply and demand. You and I can be offering the exact same thing for the exact same value, right? Yeah. But if I create more demand in the marketplace for my services because of my branding and marketing and the efforts that I make at building a brand, I get to charge more than you for the same value. The value is the same, but because I've created a perception that maybe I deliver an exceptional service or I just, because I put a lot of videos on YouTube, I have more people asking me, there's more demand. I've driven more market share over to me because of my marketing efforts. So I've created demand for what I offer. So even though you and I might be offering the same thing that has the exact same value, I get to charge more. My price goes up. My stock goes up because I have more people trying to buy it. Right? Those are basic laws of economics. So that's why I don't really hold with the value pricing in concept. I, that's why I came up with my own version of it and I call it power pricing because the power is in your hands to create the environment that drives up demand for your service or your product and that's what drives up the price. And that's when I get to charge more. So, and ultimately, I have to decide and a lot of that is going to play into what does get me excited, right? When I have no experience and I'm coming out the gate and I just quit my full-time job and I'm starting my own bookkeeping practice, I'm going to be happy with a lot less than the consultant who's been doing this for 30 years and built up a lot of demand for their service. They don't have, they, they get to be more picky about who they take on and what they'll take on, right? And they have the experience that makes them that much better at their job, which means they can charge more. Right? And at the end of the day, to me, pricing has to be about what's going to get me excited to do the work. <laughs> so even if we choose to ignore time, another <coughs> component of value pricing is time doesn't matter. It's not a factor in how I price the service. I still have to look at how, wh how much of my resources are going to be required to serve this client and serve them well. Right? Because to me, top of the list has to be that goal of delivering a remarkable service. Right? It's true. To be very clear and specific. How do I define remarkable? It means it's worthy of being remarked about. I stole that from Seth Godin. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah could probably tell you something about uh, inventory too, right? Job costing and inventory? Uh, mostly job costing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well that's why I'm enjoying the Snowify thing so much, because it helps a lot, so. Yeah, so that'll be interesting. We're going to get to see NoFi. Uh, I think it's next. I'm so excited. Oh, sorry. Hold on just one second. All right. Training Archie. <laughs> <It's not> just... <laughs> My husband just walked in. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm excited for you. I reached out to Taryn and I was like, oh my God, you got one of my favorite people. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's excited now, <laughs> more so. Awesome. So, yeah, no, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. I always love having good products on here. And I, you know, I had spoken with you, Sarah, just before that came about. I know. So I was like, oh yeah, I remember Sarah told me about these guys and I'd heard of them. I'd definitely seen the name around. I just didn't know mm -hmm. exactly what it was. Yeah. Um, so that should be interesting to look at. And now that might be a situation where especially based on Sarah, what you've described, where it'll help me streamline the, um, the process of serving a, a, a client that's heavy in job costing. And let's be clear, I'm not talking about a simple, you know, assigning an expense to a customer. We all yeah. know how to do that, and we all know that's very easy to do. Yeah. Even there, the challenge is getting that information from the client. So even at the simplest level with job costing, it introduces a parameter that adds to that adds a challenge, right? Because mm -hmm. now I, there's no way I'm going to know as the accountant what expense goes to which client. 
Yeah. So now I need to build into my service a system through which the client can provide me with that information. And it's very easy to start overwhelming the client because I can set up a project in Smartsheet and say, well, log into Smartsheet. But then the client says, I don't understand Smartsheet. I don't know mm -hmm. how to use it. Right? And so what I'm finding even in the service-based business is because I'm using Smartsheet still for the uncategorized stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and just this morning, I have to schedule a call with one of my clients so I can walk them through how Smartsheet works. Right? Oh, wow. Okay. So, because it's Smartsheet is an amazing and powerful app, but remember, you're really building the project based around a specific need in Smartsheet. Mm -hmm. Right? Because at the outset, it's just like a spreadsheet. So you have to create it. You know, there's mm -hmm. a certain amount of construction required to get yeah. Smartsheet set up yeah. for a specific use. And that means I've got to train the client so the client understands. Because most of the time, the clients, and the clients aren't like us. As accountants, we see something that looks like a spreadsheet, we get it right away. Right, but yeah. the client has the client sees a spreadsheet and they say, ah, you know, like, too many numbers. <laughs> yeah, too many rows and columns. I don't know what to do. It looks like ledger paper. Yeah, you get excited. The client gets scared. So the point is, you have to now build into your system a way to educate the client about how to get you the information that you need from them. So maybe mm -hmm. spreadsheets not the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, you and you want to find sort of the lowest common denominator that's going to work for every client right? Yeah. Because again, we want to streamline the systems. I want my system to work the same no matter who the client is. Yeah. So, yeah. so a smart sheet's not going to work for everybody because some people don't get it. Then I've got to find a lower common denominator, something that's going to be easily understood by anybody tech savvy or not, mm -hmm. right? Unless you want to create as your niche that you're serving only tech savvy clients, but that's a little subjective and hard to, to that's hard. <laughs> coming in the door. You know, you can ask them, and out yeah. of pride, a lot of them are going to say, oh, yeah, we have no problem with technology. Then you invite them into Smartsheet, and you get that deer in the headlights reaction. <laughs> so the point is, yeah. how do I get the information from the client for what – I've had clients, you know, tell me in this day and age even, oh, well, we'll just write down the name of the job on the receipt, and we'll scan it to you. And I'm like, absolutely not. No. I don't no. read handwriting. I read, I read typewritten stuff on a mm -hmm. computer all day, but I'm not going to try and decipher <laughs> your handwriting to figure out which of your clients it is. And then I need to know when there's a new client. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. now I need to, because otherwise I'm going to get job costing information for a client that I don't even have in QuickBooks yet because I don't know about it until you write it on a receipt. Uh-uh. That's not yeah. going to work. <laughs> I need a way. And then they say, well, we can just email it to you. Nope. Your email is going to get buried in 400 emails a day that I get, and I'm never yeah. going to see it, and I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to make mistakes. Guaranteed, I'm not going to get it right if you're going to email it to me, right? Yeah, so, it's true. It's the same thing. It's the same. I mean, there's like five salespeople in this office and a couple of project managers. It's the same thing. And how do you decode? So the beauty of, of this system is that you just take the people buying are the people entering the information. So you mm -hmm. take the onus off the data entry part, but you're take, you're giving accountability and ownership to managing the job specifically. So right. to your point, I mean, you're right. I, I am so tired of looking at, I have a whole stack here right now of countless receipts to go through. <laughs> like, I'm like, all right, go through this. <laughs> so yeah, it's nice. So James, um, is it James Claim Klein? Clemay. Clemay, yeah. He and I did a session on uh, Monday and just kind of looked at things and he had some great questions and I wrote into Taryn and asked some of these questions because they were they're really good and they're things that I'm not thinking about because I'm kind of in the integration portion of it and setting people up but it's the same struggle whether you're the bookkeeper inside the business or you're the person outside the business trying to get the information it is the same darn struggle to get that data right so, and one of my concerns even when you say that you get the buyer to enter the information, I mean, that does relieve a lot, but then I still have to count on the buyer to do it. And I'm exactly. sure there are going to be times when the buyer enters an expense and forgets to put the customer in there, mm -hmm. right? And there's no way to require it. There's no yeah. way to, to say you can't save this transaction without a customer in there, right? Well, it's kind of hard to do, but you can dump it into general, I noticed, which I'm a little leery of. Um, but you're right. It is it's a challenge in mining the data when it comes in. And that's where I feel like eventually I'll be spending most of the time is how does it come in? Cause it automatically sinks into QB. Oh, mm -hmm. which is beautiful, but making sure that goes to the right places. And it, I think it needs a little bit more robust um, abilities on their end to match up right. um, and how users do it. And, th and then in the end, you're going to still have to create a report and, and build yes. that into your process where you're going to be able to look at that report and say, here's the stuff that didn't get job costed or didn't get job costed properly. I mm -hmm. need you to review this and get me the answers I need. 
So, yeah. Which is, again, it's, it's, it's great to serve clients like that because it is more challenging and so you can charge more. The whole reason that originally when I went into business, when, before anybody used QuickBooks Online, um, I specialized specifically in inventory and job costing and real estate because I felt those are areas that were extra challenging and I felt that because of that I could charge more, right? Because a lot of accountants don't want to be bothered with those complexities, so they just focus on service-based businesses. And so for those reasons, for the same reasons that I originally specialized in those kinds of businesses, I'm out with respect to those businesses now because I have a whole different business model for myself. I want to build something that's easy to streamline and easy to scale because quite frankly, in the next two years, I have a financial model that I've built out because like I said, I'm rewriting my business plan that says, you know, by the end of this year, I'm going to have 10 of these clients at $1,500 a month. And by the end of next year, I want 100 of them because these things have a way of building momentum. So as you take more clients in, you get more clients. You start getting the referrals and, you know, from the existing clients. So it builds momentum. So do the math. 100 clients at $1,500 a month is a pretty nice stream of income for any consulting business. And, and that's just one vertical for me that I'm focused very heavily right now on building. It's another reason I don't wanna be distracted by going and speaking at conferences, going back to what we were talking about at the top of the hour, because I don't, I, I, it is a distraction for me right now to go speak at conferences. So I said to myself, I'm gonna choose one because I love seeing everybody. Um, and, I, and I genuinely do. So I wanna choose one conference to go to. And all in all, when I add up all the numbers around which one makes the most sense for me to be at, you know, it pretty quickly this year added up to QuickBooks Connect as the conference for me to attend. Um, and I got invited to speak uh, just earlier this week at another conference, and I was very honest with them. I said, look, the only way I'm going to be able to even consider it is if all my expenses are covered. Because otherwise, I can't afford the time out of my office and the time not focused on building this vertical of mine. Um, and they got back to me and they said, look, totally get it, but unfortunately, we don't have the budget for that. And I said, I totally get it. Let's, tr let's try it again next year. You know, maybe next year we can come together on something like this. But right now I'm focused on building, you know, because even in terms of speaking at conferences, before I go out there and start trying to talk to other accountants and bookkeepers and say, you know, I can give you the blueprint for how to build a million dollar a year business or more, I need to accomplish that for myself first, right? Because otherwise, I'm basically a fraud. If I'm going to go out there and say, oh, here's how you build a million dollar business, you know, providing consulting services, yet I don't have that done myself. I don't have my own consulting business that's doing a million or more a year in business. How can I go out there and presume to be able to tell you how to do it? You know, that's the classic, um, you know, guru model, you know. And again, it's a fraud, you know, because these people are making money selling you information on how to make money and that's how they're making their money rather than by actually doing the thing they're claiming to be able to teach you how to do you know so in other words I feel like I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is first you know there's other things I can teach and that's what I'll be talking about at QuickBooks Connect you know I'm gonna be talking about how to make videos and how to use that you know the things I have successfully accomplished is what I'll talk about you know, the things that, that, that aren't sort of fraudulent for me to talk about. You know, I can tell you, I can teach you what I've already done. I can, I can share my experience with you, you know, but I can't share my opinions and I can't share, I can't share with you how to do something I haven't managed to accomplish doing myself. It's just, you know, again, it's BS. So, you know, by all means, I say, I'd say, you know, go build a practice around job costing and construction and, you know, inventory, but make sure you charge a healthy fee for it because it's going to use a lot of your resources. So, and again, if you try and go based on just value, first of all, value is too subjective. I don't know what the real value is to the client and two different clients are going to have two different ideas about that, right? One person calls me up for training services and says, I don't think it's worth more than 75 bucks an hour. And then I've got 10 other people paying the $250 for an hour session with me without even batting an eyelash. And the difference is because the people who are willing to pay the 250, A, have the budget for it, B, they've seen my videos, they know I can do the job and they have confidence that I'm going to be the best one at it, right? And that's why they're willing to pay top dollar for me to do it. 
you know, so again, you know, that's why I think value pricing, you know, the concept behind it is just, it's just wrong. It's the wrong way to teach people how to price their services. My opinion, I think it has to be based on what gets you excited to do the work. I think it has to be based on not so much the value of the service, but supply and demand. How much demand have you created for what you offer? Based on that, you can, you can up your price. You can increase the price of your stock and then you can charge more for what you do. And the bottom line is, when you have so many clients coming in and asking you for help, then you have the leverage of being able to turn people away and say, you don't think it's worth that much? That's fine, go find somebody who's willing to provide you with that, you know, for what you think it's worth. But meanwhile, I'm gonna stay here and hold out and wait for the people who recognize the, that the value of what I offer is, is higher because it's better. And that was one of the things when I started rewriting my business plan this year that I looked at based specifically on what I learned from watching Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, and he talked in one of the first videos that I had watched of his a couple months back. It was the first video of his that I watched in a long time because I'd gotten away from doing that. I was so busy producing content that I sort of lost sight of the fact that I have to learn too. You know, I have to go somewhere and learn and absorb information. So one of the first videos that he, um, uh, you know, that I saw of his when I sort of went back to him, talked about this. And he talked about how, you know, we can, we can be really good at a lot of different things. But really, if we want to succeed, we need to stay focused on the one thing. And I kind of said one or two things that we do really well. You know, and look at the one thing that you feel you can do better than anybody else out there. And then go, go do that. Go be that right? And it's not just a matter of doing, it's being, you have to like live it. <laughs> you know, if you really want, if you want to build, and, and this I'll say without having accomplished it yet, because I can see the road there in terms of building a million dollar plus a year business, you know, you have to live it, you know, and that's why I'm going back in my self-study course that I've been developing that I, I don't know if y'all got the email I sent out last Sunday. <laughs> um, that I, I have a, a solid outline written for a self-study course I'm doing. And it's basically while I do this, it's, uh, I'm going to kind of write up the blueprint for how I'm doing it. Um, and, and, and based on that, what I can see as far as the road to doing a million dollars a year in your business, you have to be that focused. You have to do what Gary Vaynerchuk says and be singularly focused on doing one thing and doing it really, really well. And that's why I said I need to minimize the distractions by streamlining it so much that I'm even going to only pick one accounting product for the consulting side, but that's what I'm gonna use for all clients. Because if I start trying to be all things to all people, um, I then all the, so so now let's say I have I'm going to do QBO and zero, right? Which clients are in QBO? Which clients are in zero? What's the rhyme or reason that determines who's in which product? If it's just based on what the client likes, I have there's no I can't document that, right? It's 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 strictly client by client. I need to be I need to create be able to create a rule that says when the client fits these criteria, this is what I do. Right? And the reality is, I really want those rules to be singular. So all clients fit the same set of criteria at a high level so that all clients are going to QBO. So at the end of the day, if a client comes in my door and says, I'm not going to do QBO, then my response to that is going to be, then I can't serve you because this is my system. And this is a complete 180 degree turn for me, by the way, because I used to say, no, you should be flexible and work with the client and meet them halfway. And Doug Sleater and I used to talk about agility trumps ability along those lines. And now I'm doing a flip-flop on that and saying no, because I can't build a scalable business that way because I'm spread too thin because I don't know which client is in which product and for what reason. So I need, to, I need to be singularly focused and say this is what I'm doing and it has to go through and through for all the apps. So what caused you to change your mind? My desire to get focused on doing one thing and doing it really well and looking at what, where are the distractions that are going to take me away from my goal. And that was, I noticed that was a distraction because now I have to stop and think about who's in what product and why. And I don't want to have to stop and, and, and think about that. I don't want to have to train my staff because now here comes the other part of the distraction, which staff members are trained in which product. I can try and train all my staff members in all products, but we know the reality. What's going to happen is I'm going to have some that are better at QBO and some that are better at zero. And now I need to document the process where as I'm hiring people, these are the people who are going to be serving the QBO clients. These are the people who are going to be serving the zero clients. And if I lose zero, if I lose a bookkeeper who's serving zero clients and all my other zero serving bookkeepers are maxed out, I'm in trouble. Right? So again, if I'm just singularly focused on one product on the consulting side, then everybody I hire is or becomes an expert on that product. 
Have yeah. you ever read, read the book, The Power of Focus? I think it's by Jack Canfield, the one that wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. No, but I love Jack Canfield, so it I was, definitely want was, to read that. It was basically, they, in the first chapter, they used an analogy of the Rolling Stones and how they were solely focused on just getting out on stage and performing. They had all these people in the background that were setting it up and doing the advanced scheduling and all that. And said that you really need to, you know, as a single person, you don't really have the time, money, and energy to be really, try to be everything to everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be, you know, in order to gain the, you know, knowledge to become an expert, you have to be focused. Yeah. Yep. And, and that's, that's one of the first lessons I learned from Gary Vee earlier this year when I was, when I started watching his stuff again was, it, it was, it was like uncanny how it was, you know, and I believe in this, I believe in, you know, the way sort of the universe works. And the energy we put out there is what comes back to us. And it was clear that I was putting something out there that said, I need, to, I need some guidance. I need some help. And that was the first video of his that I saw when I said, okay, I, I got to go back to the source, right, the master, and, and watch Gary's videos. And I, the first video of his that I watched talked specifically about this. In fact, here, I'm going to go back, and I want to read you the notes. I put this in a blog post that I wound up. That, this was in the hustle where I wrote about this. But in Evernote, I actually created a, a notebook stack called My Success Manual. And then there's a notebook within that called My Success Plan. And so the first note I have in here from that was the notes I took. Um, and I'm going to copy and paste this into the chat for you so you can watch the video. And it was called Hustle and Filters and Hustle and Filters. And it was his 25th episode of The Daily V. And here are the notes I wrote based on what he says in one section of that video that speaks specifically to how I started. I, I watched this video, I took these notes, and I said, okay, now I have some clear direction on where I want to go and how I want to change the focus of my business and the direction I'm going in. So here, I just wrote some bullet points based on what he says. He says, you have to figure out what you're good at. That's the only thing you should be doing, right? So let me repeat that. You have to figure out what you're good at. That's the only thing you should be doing. And then I love this, and this is going to make some people mad and good. It should because it's true, and sometimes the truth hurts. The next thing he says, mentors, masterminds are doing what they're doing because they're not good enough to do it themselves. Not talented enough, so they're just going to sell you. Those are Gary's words, not mine. I just happen to agree with them. If you're not good enough to make money by doing – no, if you are good enough to make money by doing that, you do that, Right? So if I'm so good at how to make a million dollar business, then I should be going out there and making a million dollar business. Now that's why when I stumbled on the other guy I've been following recently, Ty Lopez, that's what attracted me to him because he's actually done it. He's actually built million dollar businesses and those million dollar businesses that he's built were not based on selling information for how to make a million dollar businesses. They were real businesses that he built using principles that he had learned about how to do it. So after watching Ty Lopez for a while, I started, you know, getting more and more hooked because I was like, this guy's real. This guy's done it. You know, he's not selling me a line of BS. So again, if you're good enough to make money by doing that, you do that. <laughs> um, next, uh, and this is really funny coming from Gary Vaynerchuk because if you know who he is, you know that he's worth millions already. So I just wrote this down because I thought it was hysterical. He says, you're going to sell me on how to make a million dollars? Like, I already know how to do that many, many times over. Um, and then he goes on to say, you can only sell what you know, right? So this is where I love people even in our own business who, you know, claim to be able to train us as accountants and bookkeepers and don't have any clients of their own. That's always bugged me. You know, you better have clients of your own, even if you're going to focus on the training model, which is a bigger part of my revenue stream. But that's why it's so important to me to always have clients of my own, to stay fresh. So I have a real live use case, uh, you know, through which I can stay up to date on the latest and greatest. Right? Otherwise, I'm going to, the, the minute I stop consulting with clients of my own, at that moment, it's like, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Um, arrested development. <laughs> <laughs> I stop growing because I, now I'm going to be training based on skills I learned up to that moment, and I'm not going to learn anything new. Uh, you know, or, or maybe I'll absorb information by talking to people, but really beyond that point, anything I'm teaching you that I claim to be current is based on conjecture, right? which means it's not based on actual experience. So I can only sell what I know, which means I always have to stay in the mix with consulting clients, which is the other reason why, you know, I always kept clients going, even when most of my business was substantially all about training. I always had at least one or two clients, but now I'm going back and I'm, like I said, I have a goal to build a vertical that's based on 100 clients at $1,500 a month, which if you haven't done the math yet, is $1.8 million a year in fees. 
and I'm not, I'm not fucking around with this. <laughs> what I plan to do. Um, so you can only sell what you know, and you can only sell what's true, right? Because if you're trying to sell a line of BS to people, then it's somebody's going to figure out, figure out that you're a fraud, and then you're going to lose everything. So you can only sell what's true. And then what he said that I wrote down because I just thought it was funny. And again, you have to know Gary Vaynerchuk a little bit to get the context of this. But Gary puts a lot of content out there for free. He doesn't need us as clients. He works with Fortune 500 companies, gets paid fees in the range of forty to fifty thousand dollars per month to help them develop their social campaigns and their strategies and all that stuff. He doesn't need us, but he's happy to put the content out there. It does obviously help build his brand in the eyes of those Fortune 500 companies, but he could do things very differently if he wanted to. He doesn't have to give away what he does for free the way that he does. And he was one of the first people I saw when I first started making videos, and I looked at him from the perspective of, you know, his content was great, but I was even more than that interested in how is he delivering, how, what, how is he doing what he's doing, and the first thing I noticed was this guy's producing a lot of videos. So this was back in 2008, 2009, when I, st I hadn't even started to really produce videos yet, but that's what inspired me and made me say, I need to produce a lot of videos. If I want what he's got, I have to do what he's done which means I need to produce a lot of videos. That's why you're seeing me sitting where I sit today, having produced a ton of videos now myself. And if I could do it, if I had it my way, and eventually I will get there, I'd be producing at least one new video every single day. You know, at best, actually two. And that's where part of the concept of, of what I built into Between Wall and Main comes from is because I want it a morning and an evening edition. So every day, Monday through Friday, there's at least two pieces of content going out. You know, and that's why I, I, I mean, I was very deliberate in how I built that model. I want 50 contributors, right? 25 a day. Um, I'm sorry. Um, 50 contributors, five a day, each day, morning and night, right? So five in the morning, five in the evening. That's 10 per day times five days during the week is my 50 contributors. That's why I'm only allowing for 50 slots for contributors. And I'm dividing it 25 on the Main Street side, 25 on the Wall Street side. So there's a lot of deliberate thinking that goes into what I do, even though it might not seem like it all the time. It's not so random. Uh, and so the last thing Gary says, because again, he puts all this stuff out there for free, doesn't really need our business. And then once in a while, every like uh, three years, he puts out another book. So he says, I have a poor business model. I give away all kinds of content. And then once in three years, I ask for $18. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing about that is as many people as probably buy those books for $18 a piece, I'm sure that's become a significant stream of income from him. But think about that. And now that takes us back to, and this is a perfect note since we're near the end of the hour to sort of end on, it goes back to another piece of content I'm about to write, which is because uh, I am going to be speaking at QuickBooks Connect. And the first speaker they've announced who's going to be speaking there is Malcolm Gladwell. And Malcolm Gladwell, the first book I think he got famous for was a book called The Tipping Point. And so what is Gary Vee sort of playing on there? It's the tipping point concept where he puts all this free content out there and builds and builds and builds and gets a lot of people excited and anticipating what's he going to do next? What's he going to have for me next? And after all the value that he's added into the world, he comes out and says, I have a book, it's $18. He's going to hit that tipping point and push it straight over the edge because millions of people are going to pay the $18 because $18 seems like nothing in comparison to what they've already gotten from him. And it can only be that much better what he's compiled in a book. Right. And the reality is from what I've read and come to understand when it comes to producing a book, and this is another thing that's on my sort of bucket list that one of these days I'm going to get a freaking book out there. I just always struggle with what to write about, you know, because if I'm going to do a book, I want it to be something that's at least got a different spin on it than anything else that's already been put out there. Um, but it, it seems to me that you could actually take all the content you've already produced when you're somebody like me who's produced a lot of content out there and probably just compile the existing content and organize it somehow in a cohesive way that I can put it into a book and put it out there and nobody's going to get mad. I think Gary Vaynerchuk himself had said this at one point. Nobody's going to get mad at you or maybe it was Chris Brogan actually. I think that might have, that I might've read this from is that, um, even though it's content they could go out there and search the web and get without having to pay the $18 for the book, you're basically just making it easy for them and putting it in a format that's easy to absorb and easy to follow um, by putting it into a book format. So nobody's going to get mad that they paid $18 to save them the time and trouble of having to search all over the internet to essentially compile, for, compile it for themselves and they wouldn't begin to know what to search for, where to search, and, and how to compile it in a way that's organized. So, you know, at the end of the day, 
you know, after you've been putting content out there for years, I probably have that opportunity laying right in front of me and just haven't put it together yet for how to go through all the stuff I've produced over the years and just put it in a book and say, you know, here's the organized version of it. But that's what I'm doing sort of instead is I'm building this self-study course that's sort of based on that. And it's sort of based on what I'm already finding out is working. Even though I haven't gotten there yet, I haven't made a million dollars yet, I am um, well on my way, you know, have been for a while. Um, collectively, I've made well over a million dollars. I just haven't made a million dollars in one year yet. Um, I've had years where I was halfway there, I'll be honest. Um, not every year, though. Some better than others. But at the end of the day, I feel like I have really, really strong clarity on the uh, blueprint for how to, you know, how I'm going to plan on accomplishing this. And the beautiful thing about doing any kind of course content online is that I can course correct and I can go right in there and adjust. So I'll give you guys the outline for the, um, the course, the self-study course that I'm talking about. I sent in, originally I sent the message, I got all fired up on Sunday. Kind of like I apparently got fired up today. Um, and I wrote this whole thing that was uh, written to be sent to the patrons that I have on Patreon. And uh, after writing it, I said, you know, I, I think this is kind of good. So I copied it and pasted it into a document, and I repurposed it a little bit for context reasons, and I sent it out to my mailing list that I have on MailChimp. And, uh, you know, it went out there, <clears throat> and I had like three people already sort of sign up for it, like immediately three people got the message and signed up. A couple people from who are already in Patreon upgraded to this $97 a month plan, which is what it is. And then a couple people got the email that I sent out and weren't even patrons yet and went right in for the $97 plan. Evidently something in what I wrote, you know, convinced them that I was onto something here. Um, so let me just go in here, courses. Oh, and the other thing, by the way, is I just this week, I'll just quickly get sidetracked. Um, I released Remarkable Reports for Bookkeepers, which is kind of the updated version of what was called Bookkeeper's Delight over on the other website. <laughs> um, and it's done with QuickBooks Online instead. And I'm also building it out there as kind of, uh, there's going to be no end in sight for this course per se. Like right now, I've got the one report that I teach you how to create, you know, for short term cash flow. And, uh, and I'm going to build on that and add to it. All right, so let's go into the self-study course is another sort of reprise of something I had done over there. It's called Accounting and Bookkeeping Cloud Practice Management, the self-study course. Um, so let me get the outline up and I can paste the link in for you. Do you see where I pasted the link for the uh, Power of Focus? I do, yeah. Let me uh, actually click on that before I forget. If you look at the table of contents, you'll see that it kind of echoes a lot of things you've been talking about uh, this morning. About being focused, huh? About being focused, doing what you do best. Um, yep. All right, I've got a bookmark. Perfect. So, and I'm sure they have it on Barnes and Noble because I'm a, I'm a Nook reader. <laughs> um, so I'll look for it there as well. I'm sure they always they, these guys always know to publish on both uh, platforms. So I just posted the link in the chat for you guys on the you know so you can see the outline for what I'm creating and this is gonna you know I'm gonna add to this. The ultimate goal right now, based on this, the outline has an outline built for 54 videos, I think, is what it actually adds up to. Uh, but the goal by the time I'm done is to have 97 videos. So $97 a month, 97 videos. You're going to get one video a day for 97 days, delivered to your inbox every single day once you sign up. And the... Um, you know, so and, and then so at the rate of ninety-seven dollars a month, obviously it's going to take about four months for you to complete it. But then I'm also doing right now a twice weekly phone call, or not phone call, but a Zoom conference, just for people who are in this program, where um, you know I spend an hour just like this, but going over some of the things that I'm doing behind the scenes with Nerd Enterprises, especially when I start discovering what's working and what's working really well. Right. So um, as I figure out. You know, as I make the mistakes and figure out how to correct them, I'm going to show people, you know, how to do it the right way based on what I'm learning as I go and based on what I'm learning from, you know, following guys like Gary Vaynerchuk and Ty Lopez and, you know, really kind of learning what I can from the people who I regard as the masters, the people who have really already succeeded at this kind of stuff. Um, and just taking what they're teaching and putting it into the context of building an accounting or bookkeeping practice. So, um, it's nine o'clock. I think this is a good note to end on. But before we go, anybody else have any questions, comments? See you next week. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>